as Virginia said, I'm Amber D'Ambrosio. So I'm currently the processing archivist and records manager um, here at Willamette. And I'm going to try and stand next to the microphone. I'm not used to using microphones. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about your archive, so the ICL archive, that we have at Willamette University. And we have it for you because you're affiliated with Willamette University and the archives here tries to collect the records for the university. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what you have in our archive. Um, I'm also gonna to talk to you just a little bit about the archives in general because we do have a lot more than just the university's records. Um, we collect quite a wide variety of things. Um, and then I'm gonna show you how you can access information about your archival material, your records, as well as how you can access information in the archives in general. And then we're going to kind of explore our website. So we recently updated our website. So it's actually, it's functionally very different than it used to be for the archives portion. So I'm kind of going to, I'm going to do a run through on that um, and hopefully leave you plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm going to try and take my time with this and not go through it too quickly. Um, it's a new system for us as well. We've only had it up oh, maybe a couple of weeks, if that. So it is very new. Um, so we're going to explore it together. So the first bit then is telling you what I'm going to talk about, which I already did. <laughs> and I'm going to point out some of our digital collections of interest. So we've been digitizing material in the archives for years now um, with the idea that it's going to make it easier for people to find our stuff. Um, for example, the Collegian um, is a great resource. So it tells you a lot of information about Willamette University all the way back into the 1800s. But the problem is, is that it's hard to find the information you want. So if you're interested in a very specific information, um, it's hard to pour through decades and decades of old newspapers trying to find exactly what you want. So now that it's digitized, you can actually keyword search it, and so you can actually look for specific information. It's not 100% accurate, but it's a lot better than having to sit in a microfilm machine or sit and flip old, broken pages of newspapers. So I'm going to show you some of our collections of that nature so that if you're interested in knowing more about Willamette's history and Salem's history, that you know the resources we have available for you. All right, so the four things that we collect. So I said we collect the university's archives and records. So those would be things like ICL's records. It's also things like the records for the Office of the President, um, the Office of Communications. It could be for specific academic departments at the university. Um, the Willamette store, when it still functioned and sold, uh, it was like owned by the university, we collected their records. Now that it's a vendor, an outside vendor, we don't collect the records. Um, so it's very much things associated with Willamette that are run by Willamette. But we also have things like political papers. Um, and we have, so we don't have a lot of collections in the political uh, papers collection, but what we do have tends to be large because as I'm sure you can imagine, politicians love <laughs> to collect their stuff. Um, they got a lot of it. So our political collections tend to be big. Um, so I can tell you a little bit more about that later if you're interested. Um, we also have a Pacific Northwest Artist Archive. So we do this in conjunction with the Halley Ford Museum of Art. So they collect the artwork and then we collect the papers. And we take a very broad view of what papers are in this case. So typically archives primarily do paper. So we do like diaries, letters, um, photographs, which are kind of paper. Um, but with the Artist Archive, we get particularly broad. So we have things like paintbrushes, we have cameras, um, we have sketchbooks. Um, some cases we have, we have one collection where we have an incomplete painting. Um, sometimes we have objects of other sorts that belong to the uh, artist that tell something about them. One of our collections, we have a whole set of hats because this artist is renowned for his hat collection. So we have part of his hat collection. So this can be, a, this one is particular diverse in the contents. Um, and then we have personal papers. And so these are more things, uh, individual people. So who were affiliated with Willamette, maybe they attended as a student, maybe they taught at Willamette, um, or maybe their family was in some way affiliated with Willamette. So these tend to be very specifically things like scrapbooks, um, diaries, letters, photographs, things like that. Um, and sometimes it's the association is, pretty, association is pretty small. We do have a couple of collections of Civil War letters 
And the only co like connection to Willamette seems to just be that like the family was in Salem at some point and they decided to give the letters to Willamette. So sometimes the connection is small, but usually there's something stronger, like someone in the family has some affiliation directly with Willamette. Um, and then we do have some like organizational records as well. So organizations in Salem. So for example, we have the YWCA records from when they were functional. They're not open to the public yet, but we have them um, because Willamette and the YMCA and the YWCA had a very close connection for um, decades. So that's why we have those. Um, so there are some cases where we have collections of that nature. Okay, so then on to your records and archives, which is what you're here for. Um, so the types of things that we have, and I'll show you more detail about this when we get to the live web demonstration, but we have things like the administrative records. So these are the details about how ICL functions, um, how it is that everything keeps running and working. We have photographs, so both physical photographs and the digital photographs that have become far more prevalent recently. Um, and so those are, and I should say for all of these that the ICL records are limited to ICL membership only. So the only people who see these are people who are members of ICL um, or the people who work in the archives. So these are not open to the public at all. These are very much your archives and records um, and they're only accessible to you. We have programs, so any time that you do a play um, or any kind of production where you produce a program, we have those. Uh, we have your membership directories, um, both the physical directory that's published and then also um, we have a website archive. So the portion of the Willamette website that belongs to ICL, we have a way of um, crawling that and then preserving the content so that people can look at it in the future. So we keep um, your membership uh, records that way as well as a lot of other like your course schedules and things like that. A lot of that's on the website now. So some cases we have both physical paper versions and a website version. And with the website, we're very careful. So some of it is public, but only the, public, the part that's public to anyone coming to Willamette. Um, things like the membership directory, we actually can make that private, so only somebody with the um, username and password can get to it. And so we're getting that information and we're keeping it for the long term, but nobody gets to look at it, um, except for us in the archives or you if you were to come in. So that's just kind of a brief overview of what we have for your collection. Um, and then I'm gonna go over some of our digital collections of interest just briefly, and then we're gonna get into the website, which is where you can kind of see all of this in action. Um, and you can kind of see how to get to all of it. So we have a campus photograph collection, and this collection is fantastic. So it probably goes from, you, most of the stuff is from the 1990s and then earlier. So we do have some photographs, um, quite a few actually from the 1800s. For example, we have photographs of Waller Hall uh, when it burned down the first time. Um, so those are from like 1891. So there's a, a really kind of a wealth of um, visual information in this photograph collection. And it's primarily Willamette, but not entirely Willamette. So there are actually a lot of photographs of Salem as a whole. And we also have some postcard collections as well that we've digitized. And those postcards very much are Salem as a whole um, throughout history and not just Willamette. We have our publications collections. So I mentioned the Collegian earlier. We also have the student yearbooks have been digitized. Uh, Willamette's catalogs and bulletins, anyone that we have been able to find, we have digitized. So I think the oldest one we have is from 1860. Um, so we've digitized those, our student handbooks, um, our alumni magazine, so, um, and all of its iterations that keep changing the title on us, but we have all the iterations of the alumni public, or magazine. So those articles are available online now. Um, I mentioned the postcard collections. We have other photograph collections, um, usually specifically related, uh, for, like students who went to Willamette who took these photographs. Um, we have a couple of collections that are very large, uh, mostly from around the like 1920s, so around that time period. And it's really interesting because you get quite a good view of like Willamette student life at that time. Um, everything from hazing for fraternities to like picnics by the millstream. Um, it's really quite an interesting, like, interesting collections um, of photographs that we have. And then another one we have from our political collection, because our political collections don't get represented online quite as much as the others, um, are the Norma Paulus scrapbooks. So um, we have her records um, other than her Secretary of State papers, because those are legally required to be at the State Archives. But we have the rest of her papers um, at Willamette, and those included scrapbooks from her campaigns and things like that, and so we have digitized those and made those available. All right, so then how do you get to this stuff? 
So I'm going to show you how you can find information about it. And if it's digital, you can look at it online yourself. But for your records in particular, we don't put them online. Um, so if you wanted to access anything in your collection or anything else that we haven't digitized yet, which is a lot, <laughs> I will say, we digitize quite a bit, but there's far more paper than we'll probably ever be able to digitize in our collections. Um, so you can make an appointment. So we typically take appointments Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to noon and then 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And um, you can email archives at willamette.edu um, or you can uh, call Mary McRobinson, who's the university archivist, um, and this is her phone number. Okay. And so once you come in, um, we have some procedures. So you would fill out an application, and that just kind of helps us keep track of researchers and what they're interested in. Um, you'd read a form that we have that tells you how to handle our materials because we try to make sure that there's not going to be any damage to them. So it's things like washing your hands, not eating and drinking around them, um, not using pens that could leave permanent marks, things like that. Um, and then we have a reading room, which is quite lovely, which you can um, sit down in and we'll bring your records out to you based on what you're interested in looking at. Okay, and so the archive staff, other than myself, Mary McRobinson, who I mentioned, is the university archivist. And then we also have Solicity Icefire, who's our archives assistant. So she works part-time in the library and then part-time in the archives. So you can see her downstairs on the first floor in the administrative offices um, or upstairs in the archives. And so she helps us get a lot of our nitty-gritty details taken care of. All right, so with that, we're going to move on to live demonstration. And I'm going to try and keep talking into the microphone. Okay. All right, so how many of you are familiar with the library website for Willamette? Okay, just a handful. So I'm going to start from Willamette's website. Um, so you can also do library.willamette.edu, but I know how much of a pain it is to remember things like that. So, so they don't make it terribly easy to find the library. <laughs> um, but if you go to academics, because libraries are academic things, and then if you scroll down on the left-hand side, you'll see libraries. And you have a lovely photograph of the Mark Hat Marco Hatfield Library, which is where we're located. And so then you have to click on Marco Hatfield Library. And then you'll notice that there's a tab that says University Archives. And there's also an option over here on the left. And also, if you want to know, um, like, just kind of a brief version of what I'm telling you right now, I actually have a blog post up right now that talks about what we're going to look at searching the archives. So I'm going to click on the tab. So this is the new feature. So I'm going to try using this thing. So in the past, you couldn't search. You had to look at static pages. So for example, if you wanted to look at um, the archives and records, so the university archives and records, you had to look at these lists, okay? So which meant that you had to know what you wanted. So for example, um, in your case, you probably want the ICL records, so that would be somewhat easier at least. Um, so you would go through here and see if you can find them. Yes, which required, yes, there we go. <laughs> and then you could access them. And this also looks different because of the system we're using. So it used to be a very simple static page, and now it's a lot more dynamic. So that used to be the only way that you could get to our collections, is you had to know what you were looking for, and you had to select from a list. So that's not terribly helpful, especially now that we're in a world where we're used to Google and being able to just search for things. So what we wanted to do is to give our students and our other community members another option for finding the material that we have in the archives. And so that is what the search box is for. So now you can start enter a search term in this box, and it will take you in to look at those uh, guides to our collection. So I'm going to type ICL and hit enter, and there it is. So this is the new system. So this is database driven on the back end. Um, so instead of static documents that we had to load up onto a web page that you couldn't search among, you now can search a database to find this information. The nice thing about this is that you can search within the results. So if you're not seeing exactly what you want here, you can still keep searching within the result list you already have, which is nice. 
You can do it by years if you want. We also have these things called filters. So it's kind of like when you're, if you go shopping online, they let you narrow things down. Um, usually menus on the left or the right hand side. So this is similar. So for example, if you know like you're interested in um, John Day, Oregon, you could click on this and see what it is that we have that's related to John Day, Oregon. Um, or if you see someone's name on here that you're interested in, you could click on that and see who it is. So you'll notice there's the Willamette University Institute for Continued Learning, Ooh, right there. So you are on there as a name, as an organization. So it's just another way to be able to access this information um, and give you a little bit more um, to work with. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at your collection. So we've, it's broken down now that it's on a uh, more dynamic website. So instead of being just kind of a static document, there's a lot more options for clicking through things. So for example, um, you can go to the collection overview, which is what we're on right now. And you can see things like the description. So this just kind of encompasses the overall collection. And you'll notice that we do have some links in here um, to the web archive. So if you want to get to the archive of the website, you can click here. I'm going to go ahead and open that in a new tab so you can see what that looks like. So this is done through something called the Internet Archive. Um, you may, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Wayback Machine, but when the Internet Archive first started, like their goal was to archive the entire Internet. <laughs> Um, which, as I'm sure you can imagine now, is a very lofty goal that they, didn't, they couldn't achieve on their own, which is now why they offer their services. So um, they still try and archive as much as they can of the web, but now they sell their services to uh, organizations like Willamette University, and then we decide what we want to keep. Like, what do we want to keep for the future that's out there on the web, and then we can create an archive of it. And so every time that we crawl the web page, it creates one of these links with a date on it. And I'm gonna see if I can make this a little bit bigger because I realize it's probably quite small. There we go. So each of these dates is a day that we crawled the website and tried to create an image of what it was at that time. And so if you click on it, it will take you in to what the website looked like at the beginning of August. So this is only a couple of months ago. It's probably a little bit more. Maybe we'll go back and look at one of the old, old versions. So, but this is what the website looked at like at the beginning of August. So because this is a kind of a copy of the website, it doesn't have quite the same functionality as a live website. Uh, primarily you can't search for anything once you're in here. You literally have to click through to find things. Um, which can be kind of a pain. Um, so let's look, at, let's look at September 23rd, 2015. So over three years ago which is when we first started crawling the website. And that's because Willamette knew that they were gonna switch the appearance of the website. They were gonna change it radically. So they wanted to be able to preserve the old version um, before they moved to the new version. And so, um, actually this one looks like, this one might be when they just barely moved to the new version. So the other one is actually at this link, now that I think about it. So this is before they switched. Wait, wrong, this one, <laughs> there we go. I think this one should be before they switched. There we go, yes, that does not look like the current website. So you can see that it's a much older style of website, but we have it. Um, so that means that if you're interested in something that was on the website three years ago, we may have it here. If it's before that, unfortunately, it may exist on some like CD somewhere on campus and maybe one day it'll make it to the archives, uh, but it won't look like this and it won't be as accessible as this. So this is actually very um, useful because you can interact with it mostly like a website, um, whereas when they had to keep a bunch of files on a disk in order to preserve a website, you basically just had the pieces of the website, but you couldn't really interact with it like you can with this. So that was kind of the detriment of saving websites that way, is that you couldn't interact with it like you can with this. So you can click through this and look at things instead of having to go through a bunch of uh, Word doc files or photo files that, don't, that aren't in the context of a website. See how long it takes it to load this. Oh, there it goes, not too bad. A Little slow. So that's what it used to look like. So this is a nice feature, being able to look at your historic website. 
Um, so there's other things that we put in here. So just general information, like the materials are primarily in English. If we've noticed any other languages, we try and make note of that. Um, things about access. So it says here, as per the university records management policy, these records are closed to researchers. So that means that um, people just can't come in off the street and look at them. But you as members of this organization can look at them. So that's really all that means, is we're just not going to let some person who wandered in look at these. You, they have to say that they, they have to show us that they're an ICL member. Um, it tells us how much we have. So we have about four linear feet. That just mostly is for our sake, so we know how, know how much of our shelves it takes up. Um, and then we have other things, like additional descriptions. So things like um, just a brief overview of the material, uh, the historical information about this collection and the organization, um, how we've arranged it, where it is, how we get it, things like that. Um, there are subjects associated with it. So usually subjects, these are people's names. Um, they might also be locations. So for example, if you went, on to a, a, went to a field trip somewhere, we may have added that, um, depending on how significant it seemed within the collection. Um, we try not to get too carried away with these uh, subjects. But if we think that it's going to help somebody get to it, then we want to add that subject. And so if you ever do see something on your records here, like as you're looking around, if anything ever seems inaccurate, or if you think that there's something we could add to make it better, do reach out to us and we'll let you know whether or not that's something we can do. Uh, the nice thing about this system is actually very easy to make changes. So the moment we change something on the back end that we have access to, it only takes it a few minutes to change in this version, which is really nice. Before we had to go through this whole process and it, so it was something that we didn't do very often just because it was all of these steps that we had to take. Whereas this is pretty much instantaneous, which is extremely adva advantageous to us and to you. So changes take place immediately. So if you notice that somebody's name is misspelled, like we can change that immediately without having to wait and go through this whole process. Okay. So and then there's some other things down here, like related names. So you as an organization created this and other administrative information. But the main thing is how do you navigate through it? So I'm dragging this thing over here. So this is basically how we have it organized. So we kind of break it down um, when we do archival collections because they're big. So yours is four linear feet. One of our political collections that's open right now, I think we have almost 900 boxes open. Can you imagine? And I'll show you the finding aids so you can see. Can you imagine like 900 boxes, like trying to find what you want in 900 boxes without being able to search? <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so this is meant to kind of help with that. So it kind of breaks it down so you can kind of see how we've structured it. So if you were interested in your administrative files, for example, if you click on the little arrow, oh, I need to scroll this. That's what I got to scroll. Um, it then tells you this is a folder listing. So these are all the folders that we have in your administrative files. And hopefully those descriptions are helpful. Sometimes if we needed to, like we'll add a little bit of extra information if we have it. Um, sometimes if there's not really anything to add, we won't. Um, so this is another area where if you think that there's more information that we could add to make it more helpful, we would appreciate knowing that. Uh, because these, I mean, we're doing this on your behalf, but they're not our records personally. So you, as the members who might want to find things, if there's something that would help you, we would appreciate knowing that. And so then you can shrink that back up and go on to other things. So the curriculum, for example. So you can see the schedules from 1993 to 2003 right there. Um, so going all the way up to 2015. And so now most of this is on the website. So it's not listed here because you can get to it on the website and the archive of the website. All right, so photographs, um, as much as possible, we try, I try and keep this up to date. So there's the analog photographs, so those are the physical like photographs you can have in your hand and flop around. So we have those um, going back to 2000, or well actually no, we have some even old, earlier than that, 1994. Um, and then nowadays most of them are digital, so if I shrink that and click on digital, uh, we have them on disk, and then we also have ones that are our web content. So these are the ones that are being uploaded um, to Google um, on your behalf for all of your events. And so then I download them, and I put them into a digital preservation system so that they'll survive into the future. Um, and then your historians are responsible for making sure that we know who's in the photographs and where you are and when you went and all those fun things. So that's one of the things your historians do for you is they keep track of all your digital photos so that when they end up in the archive, we actually know what they are and who was there and where you guys went and when you went. 
um, which is very important information to have that we don't often get for photographs. It'd be, you'd be amazed at how many photographs are in the archives where we have no idea at all. Like, it's just a big guessing game. Um, we would need somebody to come in who knew that person to be able to tell us the, uh, what we were looking at or who we were looking at, um, because we just don't know, but we always hope someday someone will come along who can identify it for us. So that's the big part of navigating. Um, but you can also look at the overall like organization in this way. So if you don't like this over here, um, this over here on the left kind of expands it out um, with all the information. And then as you scroll down, it'll um, open this up for you. So you can kind of see where it is over here on the right-hand side. You can click on the right-hand side and it'll jump on the left-hand side. Um, so you can see here, like we don't have a ton of information. It's like trip papers, financial documents. There's dates and things and like titles, but not any um, really robust information there. Um, and that would probably be because like we just didn't, you know, financial documents are financial documents. Um, if there was something particularly noteworthy, we might mention it. Um, but typically we just put folder titles. You can also do container inventory um, if you're just that kind of person who likes to look at boxes and like what, think about what those boxes look like. Um, but it tells you um, kind of where those things are. So if you're interested in your curriculum, which is I think what I clicked on, um, it'll tell you where it is. So there's digital and then there's also um, box two has the curriculum information. So you could do it by container as well. So it gives you a lot of options for how to interact with the collection and the information about the collection. And so in all of these cases, um, for your collection, none of this is online at all because it's private to you. So none of this is something that you could click through. Um, for a collection where we do have something digital, you actually can click through in many cases, like we've provided links. So before I move on to show some of the other functionality, I want to just ask if there are any questions at this moment about your records, because that's primarily why I'm here. The rest, of the, the rest of the archives is just kind of a, hey, this is what we've got and it's really interesting. Um, but this is about your records. So is there anyone who has any questions right now about your records or how to get to them? The last one? Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so just keep that in mind. Like, you've seen this, and I'm going to go over some of the other stuff. So think about it as I've shown it to you here. Is there any way that there's anything I can answer about this um, that'll make it a little easier for you? Did you the font larger right now? The font? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I often forget. There we go. Sorry about that. All right, so, and do remind me, because I try to remember to increase font sizes, but often forget. All right, so this is our, I've shown you kind of how to get into here, but once you're in here, if you're looking at other collections or interested in looking at other collections, there are different ways that you can do that now. So for example, um, if you want to do another search, we have this lovely little magnifying glass that as of right now, for some reason, when they designed this system, the company that uh, designed it didn't put like a label to say search. They just assume that now that everyone knows what a magnifying glass means. Um, so this is to search. You could also look at a list of all of our collections. So, and this, um, if I remember correctly, I think it does it, um, it's, a sort, it's sorting by title. So, and this is very much like um, how we've chosen to sort the title. So typically it's by last name or organization name. Um, so in some cases it may look a little odd because say for example, Kathleen Gemberling Adkinson, or Adkinson, um, so her last name begins with an A so that's why it's up at the top, even though K is the first letter you see. So it's alphabetizing by her last name, uh, not her first name. Right. So you'll notice that we also have those filters once again. So if you want to filter through the collections, you can. So for example, the arts, Northwest Pacific, that's a, a subject term that we've assigned to all of our Pacific Northwest artist archive papers. So if you wanted to look at all of those collections, you could click on this subject and it would take you to all of those collections. So I'll do that now. So these are all of the collections that are associated with the Pacific Northwest Artist Archive. And so there are, we have 30 of them open right now. Other things you can do, so if you're just interested in our digital material that we have linked here, and it's not, not all of the digital material is linked here yet. We're getting there, but it's not all linked. So you can look at a list of all of the digital material um, so some of them will specify that they're a digital object, which just means like it's a link that takes you to a digital version of something. Um, I've, tried to, I've tried to remove those just because digital object probably sounds really weird because it's 
not like you can touch it, so it's not exactly an object. Um, and so we have some additional filters here if that helps. So if any of these would help you find something, um, like for example by name or things like that. But we haven't done a lot of linking subjects to individual items yet, since this is such a new system. Um, we usually link um, names and subjects more at that big collection level, so the big group of things. Um, and we haven't really gotten to like going down to like specific items yet, with some exceptions. So as you can see there, we have a lot of digital, so 2,224 right now linked. So that's a lot. So and you can search within the digital stuff if you want to. We also have those subjects I mentioned. So this is anything about the collections. So, um, so in some cases like 54 door, if I remember correctly, um, let's click on it because I think it might tell us. Um, so it tells us, okay, so it's associated with the Jack Ireley collection on Pacific Northwest Art. Um, and it tells us that, oh, it's the Salem High School class of 1954 newsletter. So it is very specific. <laughs> so that is a very specific subject that just happens to show up in this collection. It may never show up in any other collection. But who knows, it might surprise me. It might show up again. Um, so for example, if you were interested in uh, law and legislation regarding abortion, you could see how many of our collections that we have identified as having material. And so the Bob Packwood papers are the one that have a lot to do with that. And actually, this is the collection I was telling you about that's almost 900 boxes right now. So let's just look at that. Let's look at 900 boxes. Um, so this one is huge, and we've been working on it for three years now, and it's still not entirely finished, but it's getting closer. Um, oh, I forget, when I, uh, when I increase the font size, it bumps that. It does weird things like that. So, haha, -ha. I'm gonna go back in. There we go, okay. So I can't really expand this because of the increased font size. But for example, um, we have, this is actually his campaign material. So we have his campaign material, we have his legislative material, we have his personal political things. So those are things like things he was invited to, trips he took, um, fundraisers he went to, things like that. And then we have his um, press material, press and public relations material. So there's a lot there. Like I said, it's getting close to 900 boxes. Um, we have information about the Dorchester Conference, which he started um, out in uh, Lincoln City. So um, we have the records for that from when it started. So this collection is huge. So for example, the legislative. So we've got it broken down into congressional sessions, staff files, subject files, and county files. And then it breaks down again by the congressional se session, and then it breaks down into the individual folders. So this collection is huge, and so this system helps us manage that a lot better than if you were looking at just one giant web page that just went on forever and ever and ever. Um, so this system is very good for big collections like this, as well as for the smaller collections. So we have the subjects, we also have the names, so you can search for people's names or browse for names. So because of our artist collections, we have a lot of um, galleries um, and museums and things like that in here, as well as individual people. Um, so uh, one of our librarians actually noticed that we have Louisa May Alcott in here, and she was like, why do you have Louisa May Alcott? So it turns out one of our um, collections, the Viola Price Franklin letter collection, so she really liked to write letters to celebrities. And so we have this letter collection of hers, and so we've digitized some of these letters. Um, and so you actually, in many cases, you can um, select, like say, Louisa May Alcott's letter, and then we have this link here. It's kind of this weird little golden page thing that's supposed to indicate that there's something digital there. <laughs> so if you click on it, it'll actually take you to our scan of that letter, which as you can see is actually quite, it's quite faint. It's actually quite difficult to read. Um, so, and in many cases, we've tried with our digital collections to try and make sure that there are transcriptions available. Um, so something that uh, was mentioned before I started the presentation is that one of the things that we lament in the archives is that a lot of the students that we get now don't read cursive. They don't read handwriting, um, which I, part of me kind of understands because I was, uh, I was born at that point where like we were sort of transitioning to digital, so I, I don't usually write, I don't do handwriting myself. I can read it, no problem. 
possibly because I, I did like, uh, when I did my course at the University of Leeds, like they taught us how to read Elizabethan handwriting. And if you want to talk about handwriting that's difficult to read, <laughs> Elizabethan handwriting is right there. Um, so I can read it, but I don't really write with it because I haven't, I haven't really had to as I've been like in like junior high, high school, college, I've had computers so I could type it, I don't have to write it. So I don't have, I don't handwrite anything other than my signature, but I can read it. But we're getting to the point where our students can't even read this. So when we do find a student who can read it, we ask them to do transcriptions for us and then when we digitize letters or diaries or things like that, we try to put the transcription with it so that people can, not only our students, it's also helpful in other cases. So for example, if someone um, blind was accessing the website, um, their computer assisted technology should hopefully be able to read the transcription for them. So it's not just for people who can't read handwriting, it's also for people who might not be able to see um, in the first place. So we try to provide transcriptions as much as possible. Um, so yeah, so that's just kind of an overview of this. Uh, we also have these things called collecting areas. So I mentioned those four groups at the beginning. So we've just used the system to kind of break them out. So for example, if you wanted to see the Pacific Northwest Artist Archive, this is another way to see um, those collections associated with it. So I can see here it says 31, so I forgot to put that subject tag on one of our collections. So I'm gonna have to go back and figure out which one that is. Which one did I miss? Um, so that's another way of accessing things. So this is this system. So this is very much searching, exploring, um, filtering. So it's meant to be more dynamic way of interacting with our material. If you just want to get at our digital material, like if that's all you're interested in is all of those digitized things I talked about, like the photographs and the publications and the postcards, um, we also have a way to do that. So I'm going to go back to the library page. Um, and so there's two ways that you can do this. You can do it through our academic commons which is this tab here. So most of our digital material is now accessible there. Um, but it, we also have it accessible from the University Archives page. So you'll see right here there's this big button and let me increase the font size because I realize it keeps, depending on where I'm at, okay. So this big thing, the big blue button, this is Browse Digital Collections. So that's how you can get in to look just at what we have digitally. Um, and this is, all, this is all stuff that's in the archives or somehow associated with the archives. So for example, we have the Blaine Diary. We have a book of hours that's part of our rare book collection in the archives. There's that campus photograph collection I mentioned. Um, and so you'll notice the here as well that you can filter. So for example, if you wanted to look at artist papers um, or diaries, like you could click on those and just focus in on those. So I'm gonna click on photograph so you can see our photograph collections. So the campus photograph, um, this one, Chrysalis. So this is, the, this is a student publication. And so it's, it's kind of actually a variety of things. So it's kind of a font, like a creative arts journal. So it's got both photographs and writings in it. Um, the Dr. Helen Pierce collection has a large number, not a large number, a small number of photographs of Willamette's campus in the 1950s, I think. Um, the, Glee, the freshman Glee collection has a number of photos. Um, so these are ways that you can just see like all of those photos. Um, and so if we go to the collection, these are literally, like this is the whole collection. Um, and so the, there's over 2,500 photographs in this collection that have been digitized. And so um, normally, you can't see it now because I've got it blown up, normally there's actually a search bar at the top that where you can actually search within the collection. So it's not just that you have to go through all 2,500 photographs trying to find what you want. You, there's usually a search bar that's at the top, but when I blow up for a bigger font size, it hides it for some reason. So those are the photograph collections. And so if there was something in the photograph collection that you wanted, um, you would have the option of contacting us and we could get you a high resolution copy of it. Um, if there were one of the photographs. Our publications, we actually let you download them yourself. Um, so I'm gonna go back and show you photographs. All right, let's see here. Gotta use my filters over here, yearbook. Let's look at the yearbook real quick. So I just wanna show you what this looks like because it's a little different. Um, so you can browse by date so with the yearbooks, because they were published, same with the Collegian, any of our publications, you can browse by date or you can do a search. So either way. Um, so if I do a search, I'm typing in Bearcat, because you know, it's gonna come up for sure. 
Um, and so then you can see it'll show you like which yearbooks. So 1916 one is the first one that has it. And so if we click on that, it'll then show it to us. Um, so you can zoom, um, let's see if I click, oh, there we go, there's the search box. If you click on the little stack, some people call that a hamburger, kind of looks like a, a very boring hamburger. Um, so there's the search box. Um, but you can also choose to look at a side-by-side -side view. So if you want it to look more like a book, and so for all of our publications, we have this option. So you can actually like flip through it. It visually looks like it would as a book, which is nice. So our publications have that. Um, and then where these little funny things are, like if you can see them down here at the bottom, those are the pages where the term Bearcat shows up. So if I click on it, um, sometimes, though it doesn't look like it worked this time, um, sometimes it'll highlight, it'll put like a rare, red box around where the term shows up, but that very much depends on like how well it was scanned. So if things are a little crooked, sometimes it won't, it won't catch it, but a lot of times there's a red box to show you where that term shows up. And if I go back to this view, um, you'll notice it says PDF, so that means like you actually could download an entire copy of the book yourself. So like if someone in your family um, went to Willamette and you found their yearbook, you could actually download a PDF of the entire yearbook yourself. Like you don't have to contact us at all. You can just do it yourself. You can also use this export function to do individual pages and it'll do whichever page you're on. So whichever page you're looking at is the one that will um, let you download that individual page. And so that's an image file, it's not a PDF file. So it's like, um, like, if it's like looking at a digital picture and it'll just do individual pages. So you have two options. You can do the whole publication, um, or you could do just individual pages, whichever works better for you. Okay, so that is the brief overview of archives. There's so much in there that I could go over, but um, I wanna give you an opportunity to ask questions. So um, at this point, uh, let me know what you're inter interested in. What would you like to see more of? Do you wanna see something again with the correct size font? <laughs> I can do that as well, since I did a lot of that with that really teeny tiny font. Hi, I'm George. I'm wondering what, uh, how do you determine what goes into the archive? I mean, you ah, could have a, so much information. That's right, that's an excellent question. So um, each archive has something we call a collection development policy. So basically uh, we sit down, um, so it's usually whoever's in charge sits down and talks about like what they wanna collect. So um, for Willamette, we have those four areas. So the university archives and records, the artist papers, the political papers, and then the personal collections. Um, so we've decided those are the four things that we collect. The university archives are obvious because we belong to, like we're part of the university, so it makes sense that we're keeping the university's records. Um, but then even within those four big collecting areas, we do have to be somewhat discerning, and so it kind of depends on um, which area we're talking about. So for example, with the university archives, and records, um, we actually have something called retention schedules, which is something that records managers use to determine uh, which records should be kept long term um, and then which ones should be destroyed. So for example, things like receipts, those are things that we figure you could destroy after a couple of years and no one's gonna miss them um, in the future because we have bigger financial documents like general ledgers that document the information, the essential information that was on those receipts. Um, so that's a very technical answer for the uh, records, so they have these documents to tell us what to keep and what not to keep. However, even within that, there are some exceptions. So some of it's at, at our discretion as archivists. So for example, financial documents being a fine example, I've been working on a collection of historical financial documents for the university, and um, so a lot, we have a lot of receipts. Like, we have a receipt from 1855. Now, according to modern retention schedules, I should get rid of that receipt from 1855, but I think you'll probably agree with me in that like, we don't know a ton about what Salem was like in 1855, and so we probably wanna hold on to this receipt from 1855, even if it only gives us a glimpse of what might have been happening um, in Salem in 1855. So some of it's at our discretion. So if something seems like it's historic enough um, and it provides additional information we'd be interested in, even if we would normally get rid of it, we might choose to keep it. So there's a certain amount of professional judgment that goes into it. Um, things like the Pacific Northwest Artist Archive, we actually have an advisory group that sits down, so there's people from the, the museum, Halley Ford Museum of Art, there's people from the archives, the, the university uh, librarian sits on it, um, we have a, 
Uh, we have like a young scholar, so like a current or former student sits on it as well. Um, sometimes community members sit on it, and so they're the ones who make the decisions. Um, so sometimes they'll approach an artist that they're interested in having in the collection, and in some cases the artist will come to them and make a proposal, and then they will make the decision. So it takes a variety of forms, um, and so with us it very much depends on which collection it is. Hi, I'm Mika. Um, uh, those uh, digital uh, photos and papers mm -hmm. um, we can grab, uh, is anything copyrighted or everything we can see we could uh, make a copy of or download? Oh, um, the ones that we have in our photograph collection? Yes. So for the most part, um, most of them we think that Willamette owns the copyright. Um, if there's ones where we're concerned that there's a copyright issue, um, then we may, like when you ask for it, we will tell you that it's your, it's your responsibility to determine what the copyright is. So if Willamette owns it, we'll let you know Willamette has the copyright and we're giving you permission to publish it, for example. But if for some reason we've put something up that we, we're not sure what the copyright is, then we will let you know that and then we will ask you to do the due diligence to determine whether or not you're following copyright law if you choose to publish it. So, I mean, there's certain things like fair use that lets you do a certain amount um, for like educational purposes and things like that. Um, so in most cases, it's not a problem. Most of what we have in there, Willamette owns the copyright, and so we just basically make the call that you can, I mean, like we make the decision whether or not you can publish it. If there's any kind of issue related to it, we might escalate it beyond like the archives, um, but we've never really had a case where that's happened. It's a great question. Hi, Hi. this is Don. Uh, I have an artifact, that, at least I call it an artifact, you mm -hmm. might be interested in, so I'd be curious. Let me make a long story short. It was archived the first hundred years in a trunk in Portland, Oregon. Okay, that happens a lot. Uh, yeah, and then a college student in Portland bought an old trunk at an estate sale, mm -hmm. moved to Helena, Montana. Fast forward 30 years, I'm visiting with him in Helena and mentioned ICL at Willamette University, and he says, I've got something for you. And he gave me a copy of the commencement program, Willamette University, 1879. Oh, wow. That probably was before Staples, I'm not sure. So there, it's three pages, it's connected together with a little, uh, with a, with a little uh, brass, I would guess, like a rivet or whatever you call that. Um, you know, you may have a thousand of them, but it just seems like that that would be something you'd be interested in. Yeah, so anytime there's something like that that you come across, it's worth contacting us and seeing. So some cases we may have plenty, plenty of copies, but it's amazing what we don't have sometimes. So maybe we have, we have 1878 and we have 1880, but we don't have that 1879. Like somehow it slipped through the cracks or we've got one copy and somebody spilled coffee on it or something. So um, it's always worth contacting us and we'll just let you know um, if it's something that we need or not. So, so. The, the only problem is that I can't remember where I put it. Oh, well, <laughs> that also but, happens. But so. I assure you it's in my possession and one of these days I'm going to show up at All right, well, if you ever archives. find it, do let us know. Hi, over oh, here. sorry. Sally Shriver. Um, would my credentials allow my brother-in-law to come to the archives? His mother graduated from Willamette and he might be interested in, you know, going back and looking at uh, oh, so things that's, of her error. Yes, that's an excellent question that I did not address. So for you, um, so it depends on what it is, but so for the ICL, only ICL members can access your material. Um, university records, um, for the, uh, let's see, for the first 25 years of the record's existence, only the department that produced that record can look at it, and it's 50 years for the Board of Trustees for their records. However, everything else that's beyond either those time limits um, or is part of our other collections is open to anybody provided that we've processed it and made it available. So um, as long as we've created a, a guide for it um, and as long as there's not something in like the deed of gift that says like these items have to be closed for this amount of time, anyone is welcome to come to the archives, anybody. So. Um, 
we are, uh, we are community oriented, a little bit more so than say like the library is. I mean, our library is pretty community oriented, but the archives is very much for everyone. Like we try and um, gear things as much as possible toward our students for their learning benefit, but anyone is welcome to come and do research. They, um, all they have to do is give us like a photo ID and fill out our application, so. Thank you, that was well, a great question. I think we have come to the end of our time. I have learned a lot and I'm so glad you came, Amber, but I just want to say that one of the most, I don't know, I just was giggling, was when you were saying that you can read cursive, but you don't really use it, and now when you find a student, it's like you were talking about hieroglyphics or something. Know. You know, when you can find somebody who can read Arabic, I get them to do it. Yes. I just, I love that. I just, I think that sums it up. Anyway. I hope that all of you learned as much as I did in terms of what they, the archives keep generally and as it relates specifically to ICL. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.